Good morning. My name is Debbie Beesher. I live in Tucson, Arizona, and I own my own bat consulting firm. I've studied bats for about 35 years, and when I saw the Mission Gardens and the wonderful resources that bats would have here, I knew this the Mission Gardens was a little gem here in the center of Tucson, Arizona. With the diversity of plants, um, flowering at different times, drawing insects in in the evening, often their be uh, their beetles, bugs, moths. This is all food that bats eat, and their bats feed on nocturnal insects. They're one of the um, the major predator of nocturnal insects. Many of the insects that bats find so tasty are plant pests. So the insects, the nocturnal insects that are drawn to the garden will be a buffet for the bats that would be foraging in this area. Okay, that was a little directive, a little high frequency sound that Rosie put out. Um, so the insects that would be feeding on these plants, many of these are insect pests. They would be uh, feeding on the leaves of your ornamentals. They would be uh, crop pests. Uh, I've, I've driven by uh, alfalfa crops and cotton crops up near Marana. And there are Brazilian free-tailed bats that live under the bridges in Tucson, Arizona. And they emerge just after sunset and probably many of them fly directly to those crops to prey on pe insect pests. And the garden has so many different kinds of trees, shrubs, um, the crops that the humans used through time, and these will all draw insects. This is a pallid bat because of the pale colored fur. Her scientific name is Antrozoas pallidus, but we call her Rosie. This animal is somewhat unique for bats because she can actually land on the ground to take a prey item and fly off carrying it. Often bats are chasing, chasing insects in the air, they're aerial hunters, and they never land, they're, they, they're chewing as they fly and they eat the insect in flight. One of the animals we'll talk about is a real star for the Mission Garden and that's a California leaf-nosed bat and uh, that, that is another species that can land and take caterpillars and beetles. A pallid bat has actually been documented picking up scorpions and centipedes from the ground and feeding on them. Sometimes a night roost of a pallid uh, bat uh, where they hang up and process their food, you'll find little scorpion stingers in the pile of debris and guano under the night roof, showing that they have been preying on scorpions. A bat's wing is actually a modified hand. It looks just like our hand, except it has very, very long fingers to lend support to the wing membrane. And the wing membrane is two layers of skin, just like our skin, but has a lot of blood vessels, a lot of nerves, and when a bat is flying and it gets close to an insect, it doesn't have to grab the insect in its mouth. It can reach out with this hand, so there's her thumb and her fingers lending support to that wing. But she can literally reach out with her hand, pull the insect in, and reach down with her mouth and grab it. So insects can um, be flying, and, and even, there's even some insects that can detect that high frequency sound that bats are emitting during echolocation. And there are some moths that once, once a bat is echolocating, on the insect, there's a little, you want to hang up? No? Okay, there you go. The insect has a little membrane on the side of its body that when the high frequency sound hits it, it vibrates and it tells the moth, I'm being targeted. So this is a big brown bat. 
The scientific name is Eptesicus fuscus. It's one of the most cosmopolitan bats. It is found in every state of the um, contiguous states in the, the in the U.S. So it's not found in in Hawaii and not in northern Aust in northern Alaska. But otherwise, if you've grown up in uh, West Virginia or Minnesota, you probably had big brown bats flying over you at night in the summer. So the garden, we have recorded uh, ultrasonic bat calls from this species flying over the garden. Bats use, the reason you don't hear bats shouting out sound as they fly when you're out at night is because bats use high frequency sound waves, frequencies above what we can hear. Humans can hear to about 20 kilohertz or 20,000 cycles, waves of sound per second. Bats need to find or detect small prey items. So in order to do that, you can't have waves that are wide apart. You need high frequency sound that is the waves are so close together that it can detect a, a prey item 10 millimeters or less. And so big browns tend to echolocate, shout out sounds at 30 kilohertz, well above what we can hear. Every time he wiggles his nose, he's shouting out high frequency sound. So this is a bat detector. The microphone is sensitive to high frequency sound and it captures the sound the bat's sound and translates it down to a, a sound and a picture shape that we can hear. Now bats aren't blind. Bats' eyes can see just fine. But their eyes need light, just like our eyes do, in order to see what's in front of them. Well, if you're out at night and you can't fly with a little flashlight, then you have to use high-frequency sound that goes out and is, bounces off, is reflected off what is in front of you. It goes back to the bat's ears, and the ears are offset, so the echo that comes back to this ear comes back milliseconds different than the sound that comes back here because when it, when it shouts out that sound it spreads out all in front of it and all of these echoes come back differentially and the bat's ears and its brain interpret all of that information mathematically and creates a picture in three dimensions in front of the bat of what is in front of it everything but but color a bat gets back with this echolocation. When we're out in total darkness we get a flashlight out and the light comes out of the flashlight and it spreads and it bounces off of what's in front of us and comes back to our eyes and our eyes and our brain create the picture of what's in front of us. Bats do the same thing but they use reflected sound. So bats are um, somewhat unique for their size. They're very small. They're a very small mammal, and people think that they look like little flying mice. Well, they're not even closely related to mice, but um, the rodents have multiple uh, litters and multiple young in a litter. Bats, on the other hand, typically have one pup a year and there's fairly high mortality for a bat, baby bat to grow, to figure out foraging, echolocation, and put enough fat reserves on to make it through either hibernation or migration south to where there's food. So to compensate for not having, well, only having one pup a year and high mortality, bats tend to be much longer lived than most people think. We've had Archie 17 years, and people are always amazed that this little bat is that old. Uh, they, f uh, they actually found uh, a, 
a bat, a myotis bat in Siberia that they put a little band on with a unique number. They captured it 40 years later. And it's just a small bat like this. And so they're looking into what makes bats so long lived, and it has to do with their genetics and the, the DNA and the genes. So it's, it's really, really important to protect maternity colonies. Maternity colonies are where females gather. They are a special roost that are um, high in temperature, high humidity to ensure that the pups grow very fast. There's this little window of time here in the Southwest um, bats are having pups from June into July. The pups are totally dependent upon mom's rich milk for the first four to six weeks of life. Then the pup has to figure out flying, landing without hitting the wall. They have to figure out echolocation. They have to echolocate and figure out what those echoes mean and what that recreates in front of them. And then they have to dis have to go out in about four to six weeks. Mom weans them, and they have to go out and try and find food and capture that food prey. And often the young of the year are lighter weight. They're not as plump as adult bats are in the fall uh, just prior to hibernation. And so it's important to protect maternity colonies, never disturb bats, mama bats, in when they're, when they're hanging with their young. And then when bats move into a hibernaculum, um, it'll often be at a higher elevation and a cold, damp cave. They, what bats do is they put on about 25% more body mass in the fall and they find this cold, wet cave. And bats drop their body temperature to what is ambient to conserve energy. So if the cave is 40 degrees, they will literally allow their body temperature to drop to 40 degrees. Their heart rate goes way down. Their breathing goes down to a few breaths a minute. And they're slowly burning the, that, those extra fat reserves that they put on in the fall. So disturbing bats in hibernation causes them to f get their heart rate up, their breathing up, so that they can fly around and see if it's a predator that is in that, in that cave or mine. And in, in the process of waking up and uh, firing up their engine, so to speak, they've burned 15 days of fat reserves that they would have been using in total deep hibernation. And so it's a little like a bank account. If you have a bank account to last you through the winter, but you start overdrawing that bank account, you'll run out of money before spring, and the bats will run out of fat reserves before spring. And um, it can cause bats to literally die in the hibernaculum because there are no insects and they have no more uh, fat and energy to survive. So, um, Maternity roosts, colonies, uh, winter roosts are really, really essential for, to, to protect them for uh, population stability for bats. Karchner Caverns uh, State Park has a maternity colony of cave myotis, and they close the tours into that room in the summer so as not to disturb the female bats because the females might um, abandon the roost, they might move their pup, the babies, baby bats are called pups, they might move their pup to a colder, drier roost and the pup won't survive. So these are um, really the food where bats feed, so the mission garden is really critical to population stability and then where bats roost um, is important to bat stability, stability and health. The lesser long-nosed bat that we mentioned that feeds on agaves, one of the important things that the Mission Garden did is they have planted young agave plants along the wall to ultimately provide food for these nectar bats because 
the the agave rosette will grow and then in one year it will put up a huge flower stalk and this plant flowers once and then it dies but it is during that time that the nectar bats come in and feed they stick their nose in the flowers and stick their tongue out and pick up the nectar and in the process they get pollen all over their face and when they go from flower to flower they are cross-pollinating these plants and maintaining good genetic health amongst a population of agaves, saguaro cactus, um, any of the the columnar cactus that have flowers are the nectar bats food. This uh, was a real puzzle. Um, every day I'd come in here to work and I would see these streaks on the wall and you see some fresh ones here and a, quite a bit of older ones here and I knew it must involve some critter but I couldn't imagine what it was. I thought was it a lizard or a gecko or a mouse living up in the ceiling of this ramada? Uh, I, but then I thought why is it only in these few places here and why does it only start about maybe three or four inches down from the ceiling. Uh, and why would a mouse or a lizard poop or something against the wall? <laughs> None of it made any sense until one day I thought, what if a bat was hanging there? That would be about the right size, about the right um, the far, you know, distance down the wall for a bat to do something and I thought it might be pooping, or I had no idea, but uh, the idea of a bat um, seemed like a possibility. So I think I ran it by uh, Chuck Graff, and uh, he asked Debbie Beecher to come and uh, investigate this. I installed a uh, motion-activated wildlife camera right up at this point right here. Uh, that pointed in this direction to try to understand what was causing them and it was amazing in just a couple of weeks um, probably got over a hundred photos of, of a bat that Debbie Beecher identified as a California leaf nose bat uh, who after foraging through the garden uh, would uh, come up here and uh, they would uh, fly up here uh, and uh, attach uh, and hang from the ocotillos there. And uh, much of their prey was caterpillars at this time, and so what they would actually be doing is uh, eating one end of the caterpillar off and then uh, shaking the uh, innards, out, innards down and then eating those innards and casting off the caterpillar sheath. And it's the caterpillar sheath or casing um, that uh, was sticking to the walls there, and so we have both both still pictures and uh, a lot of videos uh, um, showing that, and uh, that was uh, uh, kind of solving the mystery of what was causing that, and uh, understanding that uh, bats are uh, a major feature here of Mission Garden with all the, the plants we have here and all the insects uh, that are in the garden. So this is the Tarahumara um, granary here, and uh, this is the window into it where, where Tarahumara stored grain, but it's also the window that the California leaf nose bat comes in uh, to roost and to uh, uh, eat and process the uh, insects that it, it's caught, uh, which could be caterpillars, moths, other insects uh, in there. And so um, what I have done here is I've installed a wildlife camera up inside, which we're not going to be able to see because it's so dark in there. But I'll take it out here and uh, show you the wildlife camera here. Um, yeah, uh, motion detects bats when the when the California leaf nose bat flies in. It uh, it'll perch on that side. It's pointed in the in uh, the direction that direction and. Um, uh, it's set up 
to take uh, 15 second videos of the bat and uh, we have many videos showing the bats uh, feeding um, on different insects as they come in. They feed and then they fly out and forage more uh, in the garden.